Ramadan online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. East London Mosque and London Muslim Centre would love to say thank you to the following businesses and charities for sponsoring our Ramadan Online 2021 program. Islamic Relief, Muntad Aid, Global Relief Trust, Penny Appeal, Muslim Aid, Human Relief Foundation, Muslim Burial Fund, Irani Taylor Solicitors, City Realtor, AWMA Architecture. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone, my name is Tariq Hussain and I'm a travel writer, broadcaster and journalist. And I'm here today on ELM's Ramadan Online Book Club. Before I start, I just want to thank ELM for the opportunity to be a part of this amazing online programme that is helping to connect families and worshippers to the mosque during this awful pandemic. Now, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes, half hour or so, telling you a bit more about my career, the kind of work I've done, what it means to be a travel writer, and also introduce some of the books I've worked on, including my exciting new debut travel writing novel, which is going to be out in July and be launched right here at ELM. But before I go into the books, and before I start telling you about my career, I should really talk about my relationship with the East London Mosque. As someone who's grown up in the locality, this really is my mosque. It's the very first mosque that I can remember ever worshipping in. I remember my father bringing me here actually before it was even a physical building. When there was just a white sheet hanging over the space the elders of our community had acquired in order to turn it into a mosque. So my relationship with the masjid here goes back almost 30 odd years. And most recently, some of you will recall that I actually took part in an exhibition linked to the Srebrenica Memorial. This was in 2016, where my photography of Europe's Muslim heritage was exhibited as part of a wider event where we remembered the martyrs and the deceased in Bosnia. And that is actually linked to some of the work that I will talk to you about later. But before we go into that, I'm sure many viewers are going to be wondering, what exactly is travel writing? And to tell you a bit more, I'm going to show you some of the work I've done. So although you may not know what travel writing is, some of you may have heard of this organisation called Lonely Planet. Um, I'm one of their only Muslim writers. And travel writing falls into two distinct categories. The first one is to do with developing guides and offering information so that people who actually go on a holiday or go to a country are able to know where the best places are to eat, where the best places are to drink, you know, where the best beaches are. And for us Muslims, of course, how to get hold of halal food, where there might be a mosque and so on and so forth what you might call the more practical information. But then there's the other side of travel writing, which is more about telling a story. And that is often the story of a journey someone like myself has done. Now, it's, there's no shame in, in um, admitting that in our community, we probably don't read as much as we should, which is one of the reasons that ELM wanted to bring me on and talk about books on this book club. Because of course, as Muslims, we come from an amazing tradition of reading and an amazing tradition of acquiring knowledge. And although most of my writing is about travel, I often marry it with history and heritage. And reading is one of the primary ways in which I have personally acquired so much knowledge about my traditions, my culture and my heritage. And it's something that hopefully I'm going to inspire you to do a bit more about. So let me tell you a bit about the work I've already done. So as I held up earlier, this was my first ever Lonely Planet travel guide work. And in here you will see it is a guide to the region known as Oman, UAE and Arabian Peninsula. And in the book, it covers six countries. Two of them, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, were researched and written up by myself. And in particular, the Saudi Arabian one, 
became the very first comprehensive guide written in the 21st century on the country, which most of you will know until very recently was very close to tourism. Um, so that's the first book that I published within the travel genre. The second book that came out is more to do with that narrative style of writing. And this book here is called The Ordinary Chaos of Being Human. And it's actually an anthology of travel narratives written by various Muslims from across the globe. I happen to be one of the, one of the writers invited to contribute a chapter. And my chapter inevitably dealt with my specialism, which was Europe's hidden Muslim heritage. And in this particular book, I wrote about encountering the indigenous Muslims of Romania. That's right, I did say Romania. It's not a country we immediately associate Islam with, nor do we imagine that there are going to be people living there who have always been Muslim. But that's exactly what is covered in this book, which was published by um, Penguin and is available across the globe right now. And then the third book that I've got down here, which I've also worked on pre-pandemic, hasn't been published yet, but this is the earlier edition, is a guidebook to Thailand. And again, what happened here is my expertise and specialism in exploring Muslim heritage was um, employed in this book. Now, most of us, when we think of Thailand, we think of Buddhism, as you can see from this very cliched image on the front cover. And we think of temples. And of course, let's be frank, we think of hedonism, beaches, drinking, bars, clubs, etc. But what most of you probably don't think about is a wonderful and very, very warm Muslim culture that exists there as well. So when I was sent out on assignment to work on Thailand for Lonely, um, for Lonely Planet, I specifically asked to work on the Deep South. Now, southern Thailand is where the country's indigenous Muslim Thai people live. And as part of my work, what I did was I wanted to address the popular issue of the idea that Thailand and Islam equals insurgencies and clashes with authorities, which is what historically it's been known for. So what I ended up doing was I ended up going to the Deep South and exploring some of the more beautiful heritage. And in the book that will be coming out later this year, um, I talk about everything from the fact that the very delicious Thai dish called Masaman curry comes from the word Musulman through to putting a trail in there that helps you explore a forgotten 17th century Thai sultanate. So that's the kind of work I do for people like Lonely Planet. But the reason that, one of the key reasons that I was asked to come and talk on here for ELM is the book that will be coming out in July this year. And it's known as Minarets in the Mountains, A Journey into Muslim Europe. Now, some of you may have heard a bit about this because the book did actually do rather well when it was made available on pre-order sales. It actually entered the top 10 of travel writing books within the first week of being available on pre-order. And that was entirely down to just how much our community took to this idea. You see, the book is the very first travel narrative book written by one of our own Muslim authors. And it's certainly the very first one that goes and explores what we might call the indigenous Muslim heritage of Europe. And now coming up on your screens, you're gonna see a few pictures, which are gonna tell you a bit about the kind of places that I explored on this trip. Um, and the first picture we've got there, I know that some viewers will certainly have visited Bosnia. So the first couple of pictures which should be familiar is the Mostar Bridge. Now, the reason I've got the Mostar Bridge on here, one, it's on the cover of my, of my book, but the main reason I've got it on here is one, um, firstly, it's a very iconic image from Bosnia. It's often mistakenly attributed to the great Ottoman architect known as Sinan. Um, but it's actually built by one of his students, Hayruddin. But I've got it on here because it's one of those monuments. When I was visiting, I realised that many, many authors um, and travel writers of the past, non-Muslim travel writers of the past, really struggled to accept could have been built by Muslims, which is a theme I cover in there. And then we've got the next image coming up now, which is the Blagai Teki. And you can see this stunning lodge, you know, at the mouth of a flowing blue river, 
you know, overlooked by this huge rock face. And this is actually a Sufi lodge, one that was forgotten during the communist period and fell into disrepair, but today is home to the Naqshbandi order of Sufis. And um, again, it was a place that I visited where I met some of the um, dervishes that worship in there. And then if we move to the next picture, it gives you a kind of hint of the individuals that I met on this journey. This particular individual I knew as Effendi, which of course is an archaic Ottoman term. And you can see behind him is a wonderfully ancient library and he's holding out, he's holding out a book um, which he was showing me. The book is a book on um, Islamic fiqh and um, the book itself was over 600 years old. And it just gives you an indication of the kind of heritage that's waiting to be explored in these countries. And if we move to the next image, we've got the tomb of the Ottoman Sultan Murad. And the reason he's, uh, um, his tomb is featured here is because it was Sultan Murad who actually took the Ottomans from Turkey and the Anatolian landscape into Europe. So in my book, I refer to him as the grandfather of Muslim Europe. You know, it was after Sultan Murad brought the Ottomans into the Balkan region that we start to see um, the Ottomans spread out in that region. And of course, today, the Muslims that are living there are a legacy of that. The next image is from the capital of North Macedonia. It's the Skopje clock tower. And I've put this in for two reasons. One, it's one of those hidden gems that very few of us know about. You know, when we think of Islamic icons around the world, we're immediately drawn to, you know, um, places outside of Europe, whether it's in Mecca, Medina, whether it's in Malaysia. Some of us might think of Spain, but very rarely do we think of Europe. This is one of those beautiful monuments that's often overlooked. And in fact, the town of Skopje probably has more Islamic monuments and Ottoman heritage monuments than any other city outside of Turkey. And I doubt any of you watching would have known that. And finally, we go to a monument that I came across in a town called Girokasta in Albania. This is known as the Zakati House, and it, it was probably the finest surviving Ottoman townhouse that I encountered on my journey. Um, and you can see it's absolutely stunning. And it was actually built by a very, very famous um, pasha known as um, um, a local pasha actually, who became quite famous for being a bit of a despot. His name was Ali and um, he also was famous for two reasons. One um, is that he basically began life as an enemy of the Ottomans and then eventually was taken on board as one of their um, soldiers and then becomes one of their pashas. Um, and in the end he rebels against the Ottomans as well. And it's just an example again of the kind of wonderful heritage that is out there that most of us have no idea about. Now, the book, as I've said, it's not just about going around seeing these wonderful monuments. There are several themes going on. I actually do the journey with my family. So it's also about a Muslim family from Britain asking questions as to what kind of, you know, heritage is there out there for us as Europeans what makes us Muslims and Europeans, and also to be able to explore a part of Europe that is normally discounted as really being a part of Europe proper. When we talk about countries like Bosnia, Serbia, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Albania and Montenegro, we don't think of them immediately as being in Europe. We always seem to qualify it with this idea that it's Eastern Europe. And this is one of the themes I try to explore in the book. Why is that? And I argue that one of the reasons for this is because historically that part of Europe was a Muslim Europe. Because historically, for at least almost six centuries, this was part of the Ottoman Empire. And as a result, almost all of the region was governed by Muslims. And this went on right up into the early part of the 20th century in some cases. And one of the themes I explore is that maybe, just maybe the reason Western Europe doesn't really want to associate itself too much with Eastern Europe is possibly because it would have to then admit that Europe has an indigenous Muslim heritage. And I think that's something that we really should think about because most of us living out here in Britain, 
when we think of our Islamic heritage, we tend to immediately look outside of Europe. We look to the east, whether we look directly to the home of Islam in Saudi Arabia or our own homes in places like the subcontinent, the Maghreb as in North Africa or elsewhere. We very rarely look right here. And as somebody who's also worked on Britain's Islamic heritage, I can tell you that our history even here on this very island goes way, way back. So that's something that I try to explore in the book. But I also try to make it clear that Europe has not just an ancient Muslim heritage, most of us know that from places like Spain, Portugal and Sicily, but in this case it's living. We went and visited towns where most people were Muslim. We went and stayed in villages where everyone was Muslim. And this is something that we don't think can happen in Europe. We walked down streets where we could hear the Adhan as though it was the most normal thing in the world. We didn't have to ask if food was halal. This isn't what we expect of Europe and yet it's there. Three of the countries that we visited, Bosnia, Albania and Kosovo, are Muslim majority. And that's why arguably you could call them European Muslim countries. And this is why the title or the subtitle of my book is A Journey Into Muslim Europe. But enough about the book itself. Um, I now want to tell you a little bit about the fact that ELM has supported me throughout with my work on these um, themes, if you want. Whether it's writing about Islamic heritage across Europe, whether it's doing photography, and once again, with this book, they are supporting me in launching it. So on the 15th of July this, um, this year, we're hoping, inshallah, that the pandemic will be lifted and we will all be able to congregate in groups more than just six, um, we have set aside um, a space within the London Muslim Centre where we're hoping that we're going to be able to launch the book. We'll have some special guests there, possibly one or two literary celebrities. Um, we'll have a talk and of course, there'll be a book signing of sorts. So if any of you watching are free around that time, please do come and join us because it will, well, we hope it will be a wonderful event. And also try and tune in for my next episode on the book club, where I'll be talking to you about my top five book recommendations. Thank you for listening and salam alaikum. Ramadan Online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. Assalamu alaikum. The East London Mosque and London Muslim Centre has been providing vital services for our community for many, many decades, be that religious, social welfare or educational needs. During the COVID-19 lockdown, the masjid was shut for almost five months. And subhanAllah, what a testing period this was for many of us. During the lockdown, we managed to provide many vital services for the community. For example, online Islamic talks, advice and counselling by phone, food bank, medicine delivery, and support for burials. As you know, government restrictions mean that we are currently operating at reduced capacity. This has meant, like many organisations, the mosque's income has significantly reduced. The mosque needs your support now more than ever. Please do consider setting up a regular donation and a standing order. You can do this by visiting our website. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.